Good afternoon, everyone. I hope that you are hearing me well. Yes, Dr. Clear. Great. I'm just uh, practicing with my new headphones that my wife bought me about maybe five or six months ago that I never use. That's a Bluetooth headphones, complicated to use, but now I was able to use them. So my wife now is very happy that I'm using them. Great. Okay, so uh, thank you for being uh, on time for this uh, new lecture. So as uh, you know, almost every Wednesday or every two Wednesdays, we have this uh, beautiful general lectures for everyone at every level uh, that will give us more information, more insight about uh, space technologies. And uh, for sure, if you have something special you would like us to talk about, so please uh, let us know, let me know, and we try to uh, uh, manage to have something that is uh, that should be beneficial to every one of us. So, uh, as I said, for students, so I send a, I send a message that uh, uh, when uh, when that link uh, pops up around 1:30 p.m., you need to report your mess, report your university ID, and please uh, try not to use capital U because sometimes it does not the system does not accept that. So please, this is very very important for us. At least you get some credit out of it. So for today's uh, lecture, so to be given by, uh, by, by the research engineers at the CubeSat uh, laboratory, it is uh, some kind of uh, general lecture to give us uh, something about uh, uh, information about satellite technologies, uh, and hopefully every one of you will benefit from it. So if there are any comments, so please, uh, you can write them on the chat and so on. I will be presenting the first slide and my team um, Mr. Yusuf Farouk, uh, Ms. Uh, Fatima, uh, Fatima, and uh, Ms. Amel, uh, Ms. Uh, Maryam, uh, uh, Ms. Tarifa will take will take over, and hopefully I did not miss anyone. So please uh, correct me if if uh, if I'm uh, if I miss one of you. So please, uh, Yusuf, and also for my team. So whenever you see that your slide is. Uh, is next, so please let me know and tell me if I, I need to uh, go to the next slide or, or not. Okay, so let me start. I believe you are all, I see that uh, we, you are about 118 uh, uh, attending this uh, general lecture, so welcome all again. So we are the Sharjah Academy for Astronomy, Space Science Technology. Uh, we are a unique institution in terms of space science research. We have so many uh, we have so many uh, research and we have so many uh, uh, so many outcomes out of this uh, this academy so to start this very nice uh, picture showing the whole academy this is about uh, two or three years ago when we had to uh, uh, to host uh, a very very special event i believe it was about something like uh, like innovation or think science something like that so we were uh, we were flooded by students. Uh, I believe it was the first time that we received more than three thousand students in one in, in one single shot at the same floor. So it was a very very exciting and hopefully uh, after COVID after whatever. So we do the same the same thing as we move on. So who we are? Just to give you uh, an introduction for those who do not know us. Uh, again, we are SAST, S -double -A, -double -S -T, a very long, very long acronym uh, that stands for the Sharjah Academy for us in Space and Technology. Uh, we have several units. Uh, we have the research laboratories, uh, and I am responsible for this research lab. So we have a CubeSat lab, and hopefully uh, by June 2022 this year, we're going to launch our first CubeSat, the Sharjah SAT one to be an X-ray uh, CubeSat. We have also a meteorite center with a special units. Uh, so we observe meteors, we analyze meteorites and so on. Uh, we have also this high energy astrophysics lab where we uh, do research on, uh, on this exotic uh, object, uh, this exotic astro uh, astrophysical object like um, neutron stars, like black holes, like AGN, active red nuclei. Uh, we have also a radio astronomy lab with two beautiful uh, instruments. We have a decametric radio telescope, and we have also this 40 meter uh, radio interferometer that hopefully soon, maybe by summertime, we're going to add six more telescopes 
to be able to build the, the what you call the charger very long baseline interferometry. This will be exciting for us and also for the UE. Uh, we have also the space artificial intelligence uh, that as you know, today, everything is through AI. And we have the space weather and ionospheric lab that does deal with the, with the upper ionosphere and how, how the solar wind can affect it because uh, whenever you connect uh, with your GPS, so that signal has to cross the ionosphere. So we'd like to know how the, how the sun is, uh, is, uh, is affecting uh, our signal. We have also several observatories uh, at the academy. So we have the Sharjah Optical Observatory. Uh, we have it has three telescopes that we can observe deep uh, space objects. Uh, we can observe the moon. We can observe the sun. We have this uh, Sharjah Lunar Impact Observatory uh, where we can observe this uh, this what you call this meteoroids or this space debris as the impact uh, the moon. Uh, hopefully, uh, we are building a new uh, optical observatory at Wad Hilu. Uh, it will be almost a one meter optical telescope. And as I said, uh, as part of the radio astronomy lab, we have this decametic radio telescope and also this four, uh, 40 meter charger radio telescope. So, in terms of observation, so we are very well equipped in terms of observing in the optical and also in the radio. We have also a public outreach program. We have this uh, planetarium, so it is the largest in the MENA world with more than 200 seats. Uh, so it is good to come and see it. Uh, uh, we are now uh, renovating it. We are upgrading the system. So hopefully by in about two years time, we're going to have one of the most sophisticated planetarium in the whole world. Uh, beside the planetarium, we have more than 80 space exhibitions. Usually these space exhibitions are open to to all ages, to student primary, middle, uh, high school in the students. So everyone who can come here uh, can see, uh, can find something that is suitable to his level. We have also a special, special exhibition, Universe in the Quran. So this is just to try to link uh, the Holy Quran to what we see in the universe and how can we explain it using, uh, using science. Also the public outreach team also does run these uh, space camps, usually we have about four of them every year. Uh, so this is for students uh, between the age, I believe 14 to about 18 years. Uh, 18 years. So we have 18 years old. We have the, uh, the winter, we have also the spring, we have the summer, we have also these four space camps. And we do advertise for all of our activities online. And uh, this is one of them. So uh, I believe we are very active in terms of activities. Uh, every 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 week, every month, every uh, every every year, uh, we run a lot of these activities uh, that that are related to the research labs, to the uh, to the observatories, or to the planetarium. So uh, please uh, send us your email to put you on in our uh, email list and whatever uh, whatever activity we have, so we can uh, so we can contact you. Uh, this video, I believe some of you have seen it, but just to let you know, uh, what do we have? So let me turn it on. This is a very nice video showing the different instruments that we have because most of our research labs instruments are outside the, the building and all of them are controlled remotely. So that's for you who do not know us. So please let us watch this video. I will not talk, uh, maybe I will just say one or two words and I ha we have some uh, some description of this video. So let us uh, let it uh, run. Hopefully there, there will be no problem. Okay, let's go. Yes, it's working, alhamdulillah. So this is our charge optical observatory. So the small dome where, where there you have inside the three telescope. This is our new open house where people can come and sit down and see uh, this open house. We have once uh, one open house where we invite the public and they come to us to observe with the telescopes. This small dome that you see is the Sharjah Lunar Impact Observatory. It has a 14-inch telescope inside. A nice, a nice setting. You see the grass, mashallah. So it's winter and it is still green. This is the 40-meter radio telescope. So we have three telescopes. Each one is five. You see in the middle of the bunker where we have all the receivers. To the right, to the upper right, you have this Kadi Arnoldson part of the Space Weather Lab. This is a mass of about 10 meters, so it does emit uh, between 5 to 80 megahertz up to the uh, ion sun. This is a control room for the ion sun, so it has four receivers. You get the signal back. This one tower part of the meteor monitoring network to observe meteors, and this is a decametic radio telescope. 
So we have the big one and also the small one, two units. And this is the ground station for the, uh, for the uh, uh, Sharjah Sat uh, CubeSat. So this is all, and this is what we're doing, we're doing in, the, in, the, in the background. Okay, so let me now move. So he's next, please. All right. Uh, thank you, Dr. Elias, for the kind introduction. Uh, so I will, uh, I will start with a general introduction about what are satellites. Uh, there is, I'll start it off with a saying. If you don't know how to explain it simply, it means you don't understand it. Simply speaking, a satellite is any moon or a planet or any artificial object that orbits around uh, that orbits around a main object. So let's say I have my fist here and then I have my finger moving in. I can say that my finger is taking an orbit around my fist. So we have two types of orbits. We have natural, I mean, two types of satellites, uh, natural satellites and artificial satellites. Natural satellites is when we have something of an earth moon system. The moon is a natural satellite for our earth because the moon is, all right, because the moon is taking an orbit around the planet earth. Uh, for example, the earth is a satellite in comparison relative to the sun because so you have the sun and then you have the earth rotating around it. So the earth is a natural satellite of the sun. Now, our topic today is not about natural satellites. Our topic today is about artificial satellites. An artificial satellite is defined by a machine or an instrument of some sort that takes an orbit around our planet or other extraterrestrial planets. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? Right, so how did the idea start? You know, in the beginning of times, it was written in science fiction books. It was in people's minds and imaginations that one day we will have a trip around the planet Earth or maybe across the moon. So, the, so I'm not going to go through the fiction, but uh, let's, so I found that the, the premium time span where we can write about it, where we have documented research about it, is in 1928, where there was an, a, a Slovenian author and an engineer called uh, Herman Pochnik. He described satellites taking an orbit around Earth. His satellites were designed, in his ideas and in his research, were designed for communication. He did mention something about a space station where humans will be able to orbit our planet Earth. So in some definition, that was a beginning idea of a satellite and how a satellite would, would work. And in 1945, uh, there is a British science, fiction, uh, British science fiction writer and an inventor. Uh, his name is Arthur Clarke. His name might be familiar to people who watched the movie 2001 Space Odyssey. He is actually the author of that movie. He wrote down the, the movie. But at the same time, he had many inventions and observations. In his inventions and observations, he described how, uh, how satellites can be used for our communication and how they can be used to broadcast radio and television signals. So these are all hypothetics. These are all theories. But in 1957, the Soviet Union launched its very first satellite. It was, it was the first artificial object to take an orbit around the planet Earth. Uh, the name of it was Sputnik. Uh, more details in the next slide. Maybe if we move to the next slide. Uh, Dr. Elias, next slide. Yes, I'm pushing it. All right. All right, can you guys hear me? Yes, we do, go ahead. All right, so uh, Sputnik 1, what is a Sputnik 1? Sputnik 1 is the first artificial satellite to take an orbit around Earth. It was launched by the Soviet Union in 1957. So uh, why did they launch it? And what was it is scientific objectives? The most important objective was to prove to the world, Soviet Union, of course, had these objectives, to prove to the world that they are capable of sending satellites or objects into space. That's step number one, since given that it was the first thing to go into space. Objective number two is to provide information about the density of the atmosphere and calculating the orbit lifetime of a satellite. So if I send in a satellite to space, after a certain period of time, it will start decaying and then Oh, you know, given any other time, it can just, I can lose the signal. So when they send this, they had, they wanted to observe how long can we keep a satellite in orbit? The third objective was to test the radio and communication between a space-based object and the ground station. So what makes it important? Uh, one thing, and uh, I'm going to describe it in a, in a funny way. They wanted to make the Americans angry and the Americans did get angry. It, 
Sputnik was just a satellite that kept on beeping. I don't know if the, the GIF is working, but I, you probably can see that it just went and going like beep, beep, beep. And that annoyed the Americans. How could it be that the Soviet Union launched a satellite this early? And they, according to the Americans back then, the Soviet Union was not that much technologically advanced. So that kicked off something called the space race, which many other projects, satellites or moon exploration was all started by Sputnik 1. Uh, maybe we can go to the next slide. All right. So the Americans decided to launch the Corona satellite program. It is not the Corona that we know of. It's a whole different Corona. Uh, I, I know I, I had to bring this up. So the Corona satellite program, it is not one satellite. It's a series of satellites. It was started uh, by the Americans. Uh, it was funded by the CIA, which is the Central Intelligence Agency from the year 1959 to 1972. So what was the objective of the Corona satellite program? The Corona satellite program had two primary objectives, taking images of the Soviet Union and taking images of China. They wanted to check how are the Soviet Union factories progressing? Are they manufacturing any rockets? Are they, uh, are they doing better work at the industry? So having a camera in the sky gave them a better view. So mind you, the Americans had planes that flew over Soviet Russia. They had planes that flew over China. However, sending planes with people at low altitude was risky, given that the Soviet Union shot down a U-2 spy plane before. So. What makes the Corona Satellite Program special? It set the technological standards for future satellites missions. So if I build a satellite that is in a nature or some sense sophisticated, I am setting down the rules of what can go wrong, what can go right. And based on these foundations, I can build on better foundations to develop other better satellites. I'm gonna describe how this works, how the, how the Corona Satellite works, because it is an interesting, technology, given that it was developed in 1959. So can we go to the next slide? All right, so the Corona satellite has a camera. And those of you maybe like me or most, I think most of the audience in this chat will remember. You remember when we used to take an image and then there was this photographic film that we had to take to a, to a guy in some shop and then he would print those images for us? Back then, those, that, that's the cameras that they had. So if you're sending a satellite to space to take a picture, how are you going to send this data down to earth? You know, now you just send it on the internet. Satellites now have their own communication network, more on that a little bit later. But back then, so it would just fly over, take an image, it dropped, remember that like black film canister that we had? It had the exact same thing. It would put it in a can and then throw it from space. And then there would be a parachute that would be deployed. And then before it lands, a plane would just come and grab it and just fly with it for, to, to process the images and they could see the images better. It's uh, looking, looking, looking at it now, it's, it's an interesting technological advancement that we can just send an image by a click of a button. Uh, next slide, please. So, uh, the Russians were like, okay, the Americans have their own problems with communication. Why won't I develop my own communication satellite? So that's when they started this Molnia satellite program. The Molnia satellite program, Molnia is a Russian word for lightning. It is a series of satellites. And back then you don't just do one satellite. You, you do multiple satellites so that you can have multiple coverages and multiple passes over your country so you can gather more data. So it's, it's, it's a multiple satellites. Uh, it was launched between the period of 1965 to 2004. So what was the objective of the Molnia satellite? Uh, it was used for television broadcasting, uh, telecommunications and weather monitoring. So uh, if they wanted to shoot off data, remember the Americans had problems in sending their data, the Molnia satellite all right, so the Molnia satellite set the standards of how we can send information from Earth to a satellite and then from a satellite down to Earth. And that was the beginning of TV. That's how they had TV back then. And uh, this developed the, the, the stations of space-based communication. That's what makes it important. 
Um, if we could go next. So the Molniya satellite, when, when you're developing a communication satellite, uh, you want it to pass over your specific country for a longer period of time, because like I said, satellites, they, they take an orbit. So if, it's, if it takes an orbit and it's close to me, then it's gonna pass by me fast. So what made the Molniya satellite special is that they experimented with a new orbit. Uh, the image on the left, the GIF, you can see that the orbit, it is, it's elliptical. It extends on one side. Uh, so which makes it pass over that uh, someone wrote on it. I think he's an MSc space sciences student. Yes, it's, it's yeah. So it, it takes a long time to pass over the country that launched it basically, which is Russia. So it would take them, for example, 90 minutes to go from, from Russia to, to just pass over Russia. And then on the other side, it would just take them a little bit of time. So this was optimal for communications where you needed a lot of time to send your data. Meanwhile, the image on the middle is an example of how a GPS satellite, which is a different series of satellites operate where you have a constant network of satellites that are just over you at all times giving you signals. Uh, more on that on the next slide, my colleague will talk about it. Meanwhile, because Molni had some cameras and it had to travel far away from earth, so the image on the extreme right is the image on the extreme right is the first image taken of planet Earth full. Like that's like where you have the full picture of planet Earth. It was taken by a Molniya satellite. And uh, I will leave it to my colleague uh, Fatima to talk about uh, the GPS satellites and how they work. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'll be talking about uh, GPS. If we look today uh, to our daily life, we often use something called GPS to take us anywhere around the country, either to the closest petrol station or our, our favorite restaurant. It's a lifesaver. But what exactly is GPS? To, uh, Global Positioning System GPS is a space-based satellite navigation system that provides location and time information in all weather, anywhere around on or near the Earth. It consists, as we can see here in the picture, uh, of 24 geosynchronous satellites. Doctor, can you move to the next slide, please? Navastar is the first uh, navigation system with timing and ranging satellite. It was launched by the Department of Defense of the US Department of Defense in 1978. The GPS was exclusively used by the Defense Department since 1978. We can see here in the picture on the right showing the Navistar 1, which is the first satellite. Uh, it became fully operational and available for public use in the mid 90s. The 24 satellite system, it was public, uh, it was available for the public use in mid 90s. These days, everyone used uh, the GPS from doctors, scientists, farmers, uh, delivery drivers, fishermen, all of us are using GPS in a way that makes our work more productive, safer, and easier. But how does it work? GPS is a system that made up from three parts, satellites, ground station, and the receivers. The 24 satellites are orbiting the Earth, the ground station use radar to make sure that these satellites are actually where they are and they are not degrading and moving out of the orbit. Uh, the receiver, like your phone or the car, is constantly listening for a signal from three or more satellites. The receiver figures out how far away they are from some of them. Okay. Once the receiver calculates its distance, it knows exactly where you are. And that's how GPS is working. Moving to the next stage, or the next satellite technology, Dr. Can you move? Yes, is a Hubble Space uh, Telescope. NASA sends the first space telescope and it was placed onto low Earth orbit at 547 kilometers from the Earth. It is 13 meters long. This telescope revolutionized astronomy, allowing scientists to observe the planets and the most distant stars 
and galaxies. My colleague Amal is supposed to complete uh, this part, but she has, uh, she unfortunately cannot join us. So I'll be taking over. It consists of two mirrors. The, the space telescope, it consists of two mirrors, the primary one and the secondary one, and a solar panel to power the telescope. It also consists from a camera to capture the images and to transmit it uh, to us and also it has a transmitted transmission and the antenna to transmit uh, the signals uh, to us. It covers the three light regions, the visible light and the infrared radiation and the UV. Moving to the next slide, it shows a simple timeline. Hubble was born in 1999 and 1990 and it recorded its first image after one month only, as we can see here. Before using the Hubble, the left image was taken by a ground telescope, and it's not clear. The Hubble provides us with a much clearer uh, photo, and we can understand our outer world by this uh, by, uh, deeply by using this telescope. After one year, in 1991, it was the we received the. Jupiter image for the first time. Recently in 2019, by using more, uh, by improving the technology and by using more space telescopes, uh, the, they detected, they, they can detect the availability of water vapor on the atmosphere of a planet beyond our solar system. It's called K2-18P, uh, which located on the habitat region. Uh, moving to the next slide, doctor. As we can see here from the images, uh, it shows an amazing views where we gain a lot of information from, from them uh, that help us discovering more and more galaxies. We can see how the, the images uh, improved by using the Hubble and how it allows us to discover more the universe and uh, and you can see the beauty of their photo. And we can't say anything except SubhanAllah. On the next uh, picture, we could, we could see on the, the picture on the right, we could see the Hubble uh, Illustrate and Ultra Deep Field Image. And now I will talk about, uh, I will leave my colleague Mariam to talk about uh, the Space Shuttle Program, the next uh, satellite technology. I believe uh, Amal uh, joined us, so maybe Amal can take over from here. Yeah, that's perfect. Okay, Victor, please, the next slide. Doctor? Okay. Yes, uh, Amal, go ahead. Okay, moving to the next stage of the space technology where NASA launched a space shuttle program on 1981. And now let's gonna discover its goal. Space, is the, uh, space shuttle program is a program that aims to contribute to the improvement of the space science field by repairing the craft telescope and so on. It consists of five space uh, craft, three of them are still alive. Uh, please, sector, next slide. Victor. Uh, its missions involve carrying large payloads to various orbits, including the International Space Station, providing a crew rotation for the space station and performing service missions on the Hubble telescope. The orbit also recovered satellites and other payloads from International station, uh, station, Space Station from orbit and returned them to the Earth. Uh, and now my colleague Miriam will continue with the International uh, Space Station, which is uh, which makes a significant change in the space satellites. Okay, so one very known satellite that we might all know about, as mentioned my colleague Ahmed, is the International Space Station. And it's currently a home to hundreds of astronauts and cosmonauts, and they stay in the International Space Station. Now, it's currently orbiting around the Earth, 
and uh, at an average altitude of approximately 250 miles, and it travels at uh, 17,500 miles per hour. So this means it orbits Earth every 90 minutes. Now, this station you see right here is a very unique science laboratory because hundreds and thousands of experiments were conducted in a very unique environment, which is on the International Space Station. Now you can see the astronauts on the uh, ISS, and this is the full image of the International Space Station. Now, moving on, yeah, uh, moving on to the next slide, we have the development of the ISS throughout the years. So when the idea started, we started as a, like it, it was an idea from science fiction. And today we can see this science fiction, it became reality. So it started in 1998, where the first, um, can we go to the next slide, please? So we can see in 1998, the first segment uh, of the ISS was launched. A month later, the first US built component of the ISS launched the first space shuttle mission dedicated to assembly of the station. Now, when they were assembling the International Space Station by the year 2000, if we can move to the next slide. Um, doctor? I'm not sure if you can, uh, I'm not sure which slide you guys are on. Maybe it's stuck from my side, but I can see the astronauts, which uh, I think someone yeah, asked. Yeah. Has that. Yes. 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 We're on that slide. Dr. Elias, can you please change the slides? Meanwhile, till we change the slides, someone asked about uh, the astronaut so there's the one with the kandura it has that uh, can you uh, mariam can you see just wait mariam wait a little bit all right mariam can you see my slides yes i can see your slides all right let me here just let me start the presentation sorry i lost the connection right. with you here you go mariam oh uh, okay yes thank you perfect thank you Yusuf. So by the year 2000, in this image, we can see the first crew, the three astronauts that were sent to the ISS, and they became the first crew to reside on board of the station, and they stayed there for several months. Now, a year later, the US laboratory module became a part of the, uh, of the space station. Now, as the years went by, we can see how several nations uh, work together, they did collaborations together, and by the year 2008, the European... The uh, the connection, do you believe that? Okay. Uh, Miriam, you can keep going. Okay, thank you. So, uh, so by 2008, uh, we, we see that the European Space Agency Laboratory also became part of the International Space Station and in the same year, we saw uh, how Japan laboratory module became part of the station. And by the year 2013, um, it was a very significant year because they started allowing different researchers to send their experiments in order to test them in this unique environment, which is un under microgravity. Now, another thing that's unique in having astronauts on the International Space Station is they get to see a lot of amazing things. They get to see the Earth, they get to see different satellites, and they also get to see the planetary satellites. So what are exactly planetary satellites? We'll move on to the next slide. There are very simple things which we all know, and it's in simple words, it's the moon, as we can see in the next slide. So it's either the moon or a planet that orbits around a planet or a star. Or, although when we say satellites, we immediately think, okay, it's a man-made thing or it's a man-made spacecraft that orbits Earth. But there are many more satellites in our solar system. Most of these natural satellites um, are moons and they can orbit other planets. As seen here, uh, Jupiter. As we all know, Jupiter has 67 moons and these are four of Jupiter's moons. 
Now, if we move on to the next slide, here we can see all the planets. We can see the man-made satellites. We can see also the planetary satellites. So the planetary satellites became of interest. Scientists became curious and they thought it's important to discover these planetary satellites. So they were like, okay, we'll start with an interplanetary mission. So the first interplanetary mission that they worked on was uh, Galileo spacecraft. So as seen in the next slide, this spacecraft was the first spacecraft to orbit any out outer planet. In this case, it was Jupiter. And this exact spacecraft was the reason why the moons of Jupiter were discovered. It was the first spacecraft to operate in a giant planet magnetosphere long enough to identify its global structure to investigate its dynamic. Now, it stayed there for so long, it contributed and had a significant role when it comes to the space sector. And at the end of the mission, it deliberately uh, crashed into Jupiter. Now, another mission, which is in the next slide, it was very important to the Arab world. And I think most of us know about it. It's the Emirates uh, Morris mission, the hot probe. So, this was a very important uh, mission because we wanted to understand the climate dynamic and the global weather map through, uh, through the lower atmosphere of Mars. And we also wanted to explain the weather change that happens and how hydrogen and oxygen escapes the atmosphere. And we also wanted to understand the structure and variability of oxygen and hydrogen in the upper atmosphere and how did Mars uh, started losing it into space. So it's very important to understand how did this planet become this way or what happened either in the past or what's happening currently. Now, another mission that's going to happen in the next few months in 2022 uh, will be seen in the next slide. And it, will, and it is Lunar Polar Hydrogen Mapper and it's going to be launched soon. And this specific uh, mission, they will use CubeSats. Why are they using CubeSats? It's because they want to help invest, in, investigate the possible presence of water ice on the moon. Now, this information is very important and it will be used to improve scientific understanding of how water is created and spread throughout the solar system. And in this project, we can see the importance of CubeSat. CubeSats are used in several missions to understand different technologies when it comes to the space sector. So on the next slide, we will learn more, more about CubeSats and my colleague, Tarifa, will take over. Uh, thank you, Mariam. So as you may already know, a CubeSat is a type of nanosatellite uh, based on a standardized unit of mass and volume. Uh, one unit is around 10 by 10 by 10 centimeters, as you can see here, and 1.3 kilograms. Uh, but larger size cubesats can be made by stacking units as, uh, as uh, illustrated. The first cubesats were launched back, back in 2003, and the concept was initially developed to provide university students with hands-on satellite development skills, because a cubesat can be developed within a relatively short time frame with low cost and low mass, which is helpful in reducing launch costs as well. And this was enabled by standardizing uh, components. So a CubeSat can be made using commercial officials uh, components and many industries, industries have uh, arisen around the concept of the CubeSat. Uh, if we can go to the next slide, please. So since then, uh, CubeSats have come a long way and they can still be used as an educational tool, but uh, we are utilizing them as well to achieve all sorts of missions. Some examples here, we have the Marco A and Marco B, which is the first interplanetary CubeSat mission to Mars using two communications relay CubeSats. We have the AC-7 B and C, which is the first demo of uh, a laser communication downlink uh, with a CubeSat. Uh, it was using two 1.5 unit uh, CubeSats and was launched in November, 2017. And on the right here, you can see the Dove uh, which is a constellation of three CubeSats and is considered to be the largest constellation of Earth imaging satellites. Next slide, please. Uh, other types of missions, here we have uh, the BioSentinel, which is an astrobiology mission CubeSat that will study the impact of deep space radiation on DNA over a long time uh, period uh, beyond the Earth uh, orbit. We have the lunar ice cube, uh, 
uh, which is uh, planned by NASA to, and it will be part of the Artemis One uh, program uh, to study the moon, um, to study the, com the amount uh, and composition of water ice uh, on the moon. Uh, and of course, we have our own Chargesat One, which is considered an X-ray astronomy mission. It is a 3U plus CubeSat with an X-ray detector uh, planned to launch this year as Professor Ayasa has uh, mentioned, inshallah, and we will be detecting X-rays coming from the sun and other sources in the universe. So you can see how the rapid improvements in electronics and technologies uh, enable us to use CubeSats not only for uh, education, but in scientific research. Uh, we can use them commercially and in all sorts uh, of fields. So talking now about uh, gener generally about the current and future trends in satellite technologies, uh, first, we have small satellites. So as with the CubeSats, we are seeing that small satellites are slowly replacing the need for large satellites. So with them, we can make constellations. We can provide global coverage. Uh, and they are uh, generally easier to mass produce. And they can rocket right share with other missions to space. And they have many advantages as well. Uh, talking of rockets, we'll be seeing more reusable rockets. Uh, with which help uh, in lowering the cost of sending satellites, uh, satellite missions, uh, and also can make resupplying the ISS more economical and will open the door for more space uh, missions in the future. We also have uh, artificial intelligence or AI. It is particularly uh, used in data handling and analysis. So for example, a remote sensing satellite can use AI for imaging, for image processing and sorting in orbit. And then the sorted images of interest are uh, transmitted to ground station on, on Earth, which saves time uh, and effort. Next slide, please. Another trend, and as we have mentioned, uh, the two missions that we mentioned, we'll be seeing more satellites uh, being sent to the moon. Uh, we'll have the, uh, the Artemis One program that will launch March of this year. It will carry 13 6 q CubeSat into the deep space and several of which have their moon, the moon as their target. And these missions are important because they are facilitating and testing technologies that will help us eventually to make our way to Mars. And we have also additive uh, manufacturing, or as we know, what we know as uh, 3D printing. Uh, we might see more of it with, with satellites, which is useful in lowering cost of production when it comes to constellations. And here you can see two examples. Uh, uh, the, the Fleet Satellite, which is the world's first fully 3D printed, printed satellite made in Australia. And the picture uh, down there is for, uh, there are some tests were done of building structures uh, for satellites out of carbon fiber and reinforced composite material using a 3D printed printing technique. So maybe you will see more of this in the future as well. Next slide, please. Uh, and lastly, we might see more missions trying to clean up space because space uh, is full of thousands of tons of debris from previous space missions and non-functioning uh, satellites floating in Earth on uh, in Earth orbit. And this debris can be damaging uh, to satellites and spacecrafts, which is why we need to start thinking about methods of cleaning uh, it up to make way for future missions. Uh, on the left, you can see the SID mission. It uses magnets to grab floating debris and push them uh, towards Earth, where they will burn up in the outer layer of the atmosphere. And this demo was successfully done last year. And another technique that uh, is being uh, investigated, uh, as you can see on the right, is using a net to capture, uh, to capture debris. And this was the removed debris mission that was uh, successful in demonstrating the technology in orbit in 2018. Uh, so these are some of the trends that we are seeing and some of the mission types that we expect to see more of in the future. And this is all that we have for you today. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much all. Thank you, Yusuf. Thank you, Fatma. Thank you, uh, thank you, Maryam. Uh, thank you, Amal. Uh, thank you, Tarifa, for this uh, excellent uh, presentation. So let me let me open the, uh, the door for if you have any questions, so please go ahead. Do you hear me? Uh, 
I believe you don't hear me. I don't know what's happening to my laptop. I lost my connection. No, I, I think we can, we can I hear think you. They can hear you because some people texted that they don't have any questions. Uh, oh, if you okay. have any questions, you can uh, okay, you can send them as a message or you can say it on the mic. I believe there is one question about do you offer any collaboration programs for students? Uh, we do. I believe Dr. Elias can give you way more information than this. Than me. Uh, what do I know? Oh, yes, we do have a lot of collaboration, especially we accept a lot of students for their internships. And sometimes we uh, uh, we uh, we uh, we request part time students for us. So we do advertise uh, this request through Casto. Uh, if you are a student in the engineering and the sciences, you would like to do your internship. We do it only summertime, by the way, only summertime. So please, you can approach us. You can approach. Uh, our research labs and we can program you. Uh, but uh, sometimes we receive uh, too many requests and uh, first come first served. Yes, we do. There's a question here. Do we have a research team for PIV applications in space? Uh, no, we don't have it right now. Any more questions, please? Uh, by PV, you mean solar panels, PV, or what do you mean by PV? I think they mean solar panels. Yes, yeah, solar PV, yes, yeah, solar panels. <clears throat> okay, Correct. any more questions? Uh, I believe there is a question here. I, don't, I did pass by. Can you, can you get it, uh, Yusuf? About right. uh, space debris or something like that. I don't. Okay. What? To clean it's space what? from debris. Is it voluntary or compulsory? Uh, it is neither voluntary or compulsory. We all hope that one day they're going to make it compulsory, or at least we could use uh, sustainable satellites. Uh, by sustainable satellites, I mean satellites that do not create as much junk, or if they do have some junk, or if they crash, they would just burn up in the atmosphere or disintegrate. We would hope for that one day, because at the rate that we're going with space debris, I personally don't think that space launch could be possible at in the future if we keep destroying space this way. Uh, there's a question here. Uh, it says, I started to develop an interest in, in the cosmology. Can you guide us and so on? Well, the best way to to is 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 uh, uh, to be as close as to to physics as possible as a major. This is very important. So you have a BS in physics, uh, so this will help you to understand more uh, this cosmology uh, stuff and so on. In terms of uh, books and uh, materials, I believe uh, the website is quite uh, wide, so you can get uh, so many so many things uh, from it. How do you apply to become a research assistant? Well, uh, we advertise, if you are a uh, uh, University of Sharjah student, uh, we uh, advertise through CASTO. So whenever you see a CASTO advertisement uh, related to the Sharjah Academy, so you need to apply if like to be a research assistant. Uh, I, I, I believe you mean a part-time research assistant. Or if it is a permanent, you must have an MSc. Uh, in engineering or in sciences, in physics, mathematics, something like that. Uh, we used to accept students with a BSc level, but now we are only accepting students with an MSc level. If you would like to be part of one of, the, of our research laboratories. Any more questions, please? Yes, doctor, do you hear me? Yes, please, I do. I believe that the inventions uh, come from the needs uh, of the community. Yes. So my question is, what was the problem or uh, the case that made the human build the satellite? Well, can I answer? Yes, go ahead, Yusuf. Fear. <laughs> How it started, like I mentioned, and this is true, fear. If we don't do it, our enemy will. And if our enemy can send a $5 radio into space, Next time they will send a fifty million dollar missile to kill us all. Well, so I will, this is... I, will, I will say I will say not fear. I will say competition. It should be better than the other one. Fear is always there, but competition is to be to be number one, 
And that number one is the one that is pushing every country up to this day to excel in all in all in all engineering stuff in science and so on. So, doctor, is the same reason as the nuclear weapons, right? Yeah, <laughs> you have it. You have it. You are going to deter all the other countries. So it is like now a deterrent, not not a weapon to be used. Yes, doctor. Any other you. question, please? Okay, can you elaborate a bit more on the CubeSat program? Tarifa, Youssef, go ahead. Uh, all right. Uh, Engineer Tarifa, do you want to take it over or should I just talk about it? Any one of you. Uh, all right. So, all right. Engineer Tarifa or me? Which one? Go, Youssef. Go, Youssef. I, because like I, I felt I, I talked a lot, you know. It's uh, I'm, I like giving opportunity to other people. Like without my team, I am nothing. So if my team answers this question, that that would be great. Uh, what about you, Engineer Tarifa? You want me to take it over? Well, I guess I have to do it. All right. So the CubeSat program. The CubeSat program was uh, initially thought of uh, by the Sharjah Academy for Astronomy, Space Sciences, and Technology and the University of Sharjah in 2016. The idea started as a small satellite, which is just 10 centimeters long. I'm not gonna go into the dimensions a lot, but then as the time has progressed and the mission was progressed, and then we decided that we can do more. We can do more science, our scientific objective, and like our team grew with experts. Uh, so we decided to make a bigger, better satellite, which is around uh, now 30 centimeters in length. It has... Uh, Two payloads, usually when you talk about satellites, you have the bus system, which is just what powers it. And it will be around the same thing for any other satellite. But what makes your satellite special is your payload. What are you carrying and how does your payload help with your mission? So uh, our CubeSat program is called the Sharjah Sat 1. Uh, like I said, it's going to be our first satellite. It has two payloads. One of it is called the IXRD, which is an improved X-ray detector. And with this X-ray detector, we can detect uh, 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 solar, co solar coronal holes. We can detect X-ray emissions, and we can use those data to study the space weather. Uh, the second payload is a dual camera system. Uh, we have two cameras that we can take pictures of the Emirate of Sharjah. With those pictures, we can better understand how our city is developing. Basically, any reason of why you would want to take a picture from space. So those are our two primarily payloads uh, on board ChargerSat-1. Uh, it is expected that ChargerSat-1 will launch at uh, June uh, 2022. So if you have any other question about our CubeSat program, feel free to ask me. I think I covered most of, most of it. Thank you, Yusuf. Any more questions, please? What is the inclination degree? Uh, so the, the orb, okay. So I believe, okay, uh, someone, okay, so that's a direct message. Message. Okay, the inclination degree, I believe, again, engineer Tarifa knows better in orbits than me. Uh, until now, this has not been decided 100%. Because it's not about what you want sometimes. It's about what your rocket, but not our rocket, of course, but uh, what your launching service provider is willing to shoot your rocket at. So it's a, it's a push and pull. Like we need a special inclination degree and the rocket provider, let's say SpaceX or Rush Cosmos, they have their own inclination degree. So we, we have to compromise and check. Okay, any more questions, please? Any work done on flywheels? Uh, all right, so I have two questions. Uh, there is Najla Muhammad is sending me a direct message. Uh, uh, I just, uh, Ms. Najla, can you, can you please tell me what you need? Because she's sending it as a direct message. I'm not sure what, what she needs. And in regards to work done on flywheels, uh, yes, uh, so our Cube satellite has, uh, like I said, it's taking an image. So if when you're taking an image, 
in space, things are not perfect. Things are random. They rotate and they vibrate. So if that's happening, you can't take a good image. So we have a system in place called an ADCS, which is an Attitude Determination Control System, uh, which basically helps to stabilize the CubeSat. And how do we do it? Uh, we do it uh, by having reaction wheels. So there's a reaction wheels. So we have multiple sensors which measure how it is rotating, how is it behaving. And then once we understand how it is rotating and behaving, let's say it is rotating two degrees clockwise. Well, then I would just use another reaction wheel and that reaction wheel or a flywheel, a flywheel and the reaction wheel, they, they're both mechanically the same thing. And then we would just program it to go two degrees counterclockwise, which stabilizes my satellite. Yes, that's right. It counters the effect. So that's uh, what we're doing. And we have a published paper about it in the International Astronautical Congress. I believe it's open access. You can check it out, Charge Academy for Astronomy, Space Sciences and Technology, Attitude Determination Control System on board ChargerSat-1. Okay, so uh, thank you very much all for attending this uh, this uh, small workshop, and uh, hopefully you get enough uh, feedback, enough information about what we do here at the academy, and also a little bit about this satellite technology that is uh, quite evolving day after day. So thank you for all the presenters, thank you for the uh, for all the attendees, and hopefully we see you, we see you next time, inshallah. Okay, goodbye, inshallah. Wassalamu alaikum.